Let's go for a walk. This is Bouja Cookman. She's been leading and mentoring CEOs for over 25 years through the high growth CEO forums, which have contributed to the over $17 billion in liquidity values generated from long-term clients, including names like HubSpot, uh, Mimecast, and iRobot. Bouja, take me back to your early life. Where did you grow up? What did your parents do? And what did you want to do? Okay, so um, I'm a farm girl. Grew up mucking stalls <laughs> and grew up mostly in Pennsylvania area. And my mother had a riding stable. And so I was very involved with horses for the beginning of my life through high school, really. And um, I guess for me, I love nature. I, I loved being on the farm. And I was um, sort of always interested in creative endeavors and um, had absolutely zero clue what I wanted to do with my life when I graduated from college, except I knew I didn't want to run a farm. <laughs> uh, I didn't want to be that tied down. So um, that's some of my early roots. We also spend a lot of time in Maine in the summers, and we still hold on to the place up there that was started about 100 years ago of my family. And that's a driving force in my life, too, because I want to be able to fold on to it because it's so special. Mm -hmm. So that's um, very high level. But I would say in terms of what I do now, I had no technical background educationally and um, was just very committed always to natural beauty and to kind of concerns about just making sure we were doing the right thing by the plant. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? We it does. Quick... Yeah. And then you were a history and an English major in college. And then you worked at a digital media production when you graduated. What was that time in your life like? And did you know that you wanted to get into business? No, I thought business was probably pretty bad. We grew up where football was a bad thing. We had no TV. And... <laughs> When my mother remarried, she married a businessman, so suddenly the world changed and business wasn't so bad. He was a CEO of a family-run dental company. Um, but I had no interest in business. And in college, I took, in addition to my history and liberal arts education, I took one course that was vaguely practical, mm -hmm. and that was a proofreading course, copy editing. So I thought that would be a good place to get a first job. And um, I started out at a company called Temple Barker and Sloan, working at night as a proofreader because my roommate kind of wanted to get me out of the way and have social time at night without me, frankly. <laughs> so I started at night, and I think the row site's up there if you want to see the cabin site. Oh, yeah. yeah okay, let's so let's go on up here. Um, so I had no business experience, but I went to work for this consulting firm, so I learned a ton about business. And there was no real thing called digital media then. We were, I ended up running the, what was called the graphics department, mm -hmm. because I was a terrible proofreader. I was told that my proofreading test was the worst she'd ever seen. Oh, man. But I loved the creative side, and I loved doing the graphics. It was primarily business graphics, and in those days, when I first started, you would hand paint 35 millimeter slides for the consultants to take when they went to present clients. And the paint would drip and they'd come back really unhappy. And <laughs> often it's like, there's got to be a better way. And this was in the early 80s. And we ended up, there was a company called Autographics mm -hmm. and they had a deck PPT 11 and a Selco film recorder, and you would modem the data, the 35 millimeter word slides, and get them back in a couple of days. Moral. And if you wanted to make curves, any kind of logo, you had to trace it in and use angles. <laughs> you had to type in the angles to create curves. And it was a big deal when they finally got pie charts. So I know you're oh. laughing. But this is true. <laughs> yeah. uh, and it was, uh, I was so excited about this. I was 
this nexus of creativity and computers, the first PC. And I got, I got, wow. So I thought, I should learn more about this computer graphics thing. And I'm, I remember marching down to MIT and going to Philosophy Therapy and just looking up computer graphics. It's like all these algorithms. I don't think this is the computer graphics. <laughs> I'm really talking to you about. But um, because I was running the department then, the graphics department, I worked with the vendor of uh, our graphics and we bought a system for $150,000 so that we can make our own slides in-house. And then I got really just intrigued by this kind of this new technology. And when my first husband and I moved to California in mid eighties, I went to work for our graphics and I decided I wanted to be going to sales mm -hmm. and I had no sales experience. But I did know how to use the system. So I ended up being a operator of the equipment. We'll call it an application specialist. Learned how to sell from the people who were there. Ended up running, you know, taking on sales. And it was a great run until we got totally disrupted. Obviously, selling $150,000 systems <laughs> that do word slides um, and others is kind of... We know what happened to the head. Yeah. But have you ever read Clayton Christensen's work on disruptive technologies? It was a classic case. Data graphics uh, went out, went on to do a big slide system you'd sell to to the industry of folks who used to make slides for their small businesses. But um, that lasted until the late eighties. And one of my good friends had gone on to a company called Avid Technology, which is in the film video editing space. Avid was founded by a guy named Bill Warner. For the Bill, he was an icon and amazing founder, innovator in the Boston area. And so um, I was lucky enough to be recruited away from autographics to Avid. And I was living in San Francisco and suddenly immersed in the film video industry. And nothing to the de detriment of Avid, but their East Coast base, headquartered in Burlington, and knew so little about the geography of California, they hired me in San Francisco to run the sales. So I basically ended up with more frequent flyer miles than anybody else in the country, and uh, spent most of my time in LA. And just, it was just an incredible run. So we, um, grew our region. Well, well, I basically ended up running Western, all of uh, Western half of the country uh, and Canada and grew to about 20 million in revenue, um, built out the sales team. And we really uh, revolutionized an industry of film and video editing with the early Avid systems, which were Turned out not not initially they couldn't do what the a vision was because we're using JPEG compression, built our own boards, and kind of the image looked like big bathroom tiles. So the early application was for short form commercials, 60 second, 30 second spots. We're gonna finish on film anyway, so it didn't matter how terrible the quality was. And I just got really lucky because I knew nothing, Ryan. I knew nothing about the industry. And I just asked a ton of questions. And I remember the pivotal time going into one of our, the only person who'd bought a beta system in Hollywood. And I said, why'd you buy this? And he said, well, here's why. Because I can do really quick cuts and give this to my clients or all the ad agencies. And by the way, I have all these competitors, and they should all have these. And there was a pod of them in the Association of Independent Commercial Editors. There was a pod of them in New York, one in Chicago, one in L.A. And that put Avid on the map at the beginning because uh, it was all offline, didn't care about the quality, wanted speed, and I had a blast. It was just 
wonderful. Um, and then in 92, 93, uh, this Bill Warner who founded it had when we were really early stage, I was employee number 20, but I was in sales, so I didn't get a lot of equity. Right. <laughs> but um, he had this strategic planning meeting with everybody in the company, because there were a few of us, and started thinking about what the company could be. And um, I went back and I kind of wrote up a strategy, some strategy ideas. Anyway, I was having a lot of fun talking to customers about where could this go. And in the early 90s, the CEO, whose name was Kurt Raleigh, asked if I would move back to Boston area and run the product side of the business. So here you have a liberal arts major who has <laughs> never um, done anything in terms of product planning or you know, any of that. Um, but I knew the market really well. So I came back to um, this area, and that really launched my, my change of career from sales into product, uh, really product management, marketing, strategy. And one of our products won an Academy Award for a Technical Academy Award, and one of the won Emmys, and Abby went on to win a lot of other awards. Amazing engineers, and we all got along really well, and um, it was an awesome, awesome experience. So what happened next, just high level for me, was Abin went public, and the CEO missed, well, the company missed its numbers and the CEO was let go. Um, big reorg for the company. It was, it was quite sad. And I don't know, have you ever been through a, you're young, you just worked at one company, I think. Yeah, I've just worked uh, at one. So uh, it's, it's hard when, for whatever reason, in this case, probably a variety of reasons, um, the company stalled. And I started thinking about what I wanted to do next. And it was not really wanting to stay in an operational role. I loved the experience of working for a great company that was great from it. Customers loved it. Employees loved it. We're building great culture. Um, tech, it was, it was fast paced, smart people. And so I started thinking, well, who helps CEOs scale? their company successfully from early to mid to late to IPO and beyond. Who does? No, it's not your team. I mean, they help, but they can't be a sounding board because they're part of the whole ecosystem CEOs need to manage. The board helps, but the board has its own agenda, especially investor board members. Um, your spouse, they get kind of tired of hearing about it. So I, I decided what I really wanted to do was figure out how I could help CEOs who wanted to scale and scale their companies do that. And, it was in and I wanted to work with high-tech CEOs because I love the pace and fascinated with the technology and with my experience. So I um, decided rather than sort of take another operational job, I would go back, get my MBA, because I'd always been sort of the only woman in the room. And I was not only that, but I was one of the few that didn't have a degree, an MBA or whatever. So I kind of gave myself that gift and went back and got my MBA at Harvard, kind of late in my career. <laughs> I was commuting in from my house in Concord. <laughs> but, uh, but it was great. I kept thinking, wow, I, I don't have a quota. I can just study. This is amazing. <laughs> um, so that's essentially during my first and second year, I found my partner, Catherine Catlin, who had started coming to call it. She called it the Catlin Group. At the time, she was working with CEOs of mostly tech companies doing what we call building the profit spiral, which is a strategic planning process. And we met for lunch. She told me she did not hire interns or anybody else. I said, well, how about this? How about I work with you 
And I learn, you don't pay me anything for the summer. And in re return, I'll do a market research study for, on your client. And then we'll, I'll have another year of school. And then we'll decide if there is something worth moving forward with or not. So that's what I did. Because Ryan, I was super skeptical of consultants. I'm sorry. Seems to me you go in and you put a plan down and it's, and then you, then you leave that company and have no say in, or um, even interest in the outcome per se. So, but the, the way Catherine developed the process was very intuitive, very collaborative, and it was really helping facilitate the knowledge within and the company to come to the force, to the, you know, to, to come up with vision and mission and all those critical things that companies do put in place. So that was the start of my relationship with Catherine. She started the first Tigro CEO forum in 2000, no, 98, the year my son was born. So I did a whole transformation. I went, got my MBA, graduated pregnant, had my baby, tried to be a mom and just do mom. That lasted three months where I needed to get back in the gang. <laughs> and Catherine kept calling and saying, when are you coming back? So, um, so we worked through that and kept going with the consulting and started the Hagro CEO Forum. I started my first one in 2002. That group had Gail Goodman in it, Constant Contact, when Constant Contact was under $2 million in revenue. And uh, Catherine's had iRobot with Colin Engel. And we had just amazing entrepreneurs who wanted to have a set of peers who were trying to build the same kind of a company and that they were investor-backed, they were tech. Many were founders, had a big vision for what they wanted to create. And they wanted to uh, have peers help, but they also, I think, valued the intellectual property that we had built on how to scale and grow in your CEO role. So that's, that's kind of how it all started. And um, we're now up to 18 billion. We said 17 at the bill. In terms of liquidity exits through IPO or M&A of our clients. Latest one, Clavio. Um, that CEO of Clavio, AB, was in the group for a number of years. And it's been amazing. So uh, what motivated me was if I can help CEOs avoid the bad stuff that happened at Avid and build great companies, I will have had a small impact on that whole ecosystem. And that's what drove me. So very mission-driven, really excited about what we've achieved, really excited about sort of the future because now three of my alums have joined me in working on building forms, giving back what they got, the value they got, delivering the consulting and delivering the coaching. So we're kind of a new growth spurt. And it's awesome. And tech has changed so much since I started. You could count the tech companies on your hand. And now, of course, it's huge. But our mission's still the same. Help CEOs build great companies, build a community of CEOs who are peers helping each other, there's a definite, you know, there's a self-selection. If you're willing to bear your deepest challenges to a group of other CEOs, you have to have some humility. That's kind of my story on that end. And then I'm also very interested in how to help combat climate change. I co-founded a group called Mothers Out Front in Concord. It's a national organization. And we've worked over the years to get climate goals in place and mission goals in place. And that's been really satisfying too. So plus raising my boy who just got his first job starting next week. Yeah, <laughs> so that's a big deal. Um, yeah. So that's, uh, that's a little snapshot of my journey mm -hmm. and I'm enthusiastic about it and have learned so much. I have so much pattern recognition over kind of early pitfalls to avoid, what to do, 
in the CEO journey, which is what we're really all about. And reflecting back on your journey from growing up on a farm, the majoring in liberal arts to now leading CEO forums and high growth CEO, what are you most proud of in your career? Uh, it's funny. I had I was running a strategy session um, a few years back, and in it was uh, an empl- an ex employee of Constant Contact, and she started talking about how important and how wonderful the culture that Gail had built was, and I'd been on that journey with Gail and had seen what she'd done and had helped to, you know, forms all about things that probably your board isn't, certainly back then, isn't going to say, hey, hey, what kind of culture are you building in your company? But those are the things that are really important, maybe most important. And now you hear culture eats strategy for breakfast and all these other things. But to hear an employee, an ex-employee say, That was my, the best experience working I'd ever had was to be part of that culture. That really resonated with me. That was, was a show to even hear that. Um, I'm proud of of my clients who do the hard stuff. I mean, they're amazing. And giving, you know, I hope a little bit of the courage they get comes from their peers, from what we build and provide to give them support. And some of the knowledge that we've learned that we try to share appropriately along the journey. Um, I'm proud of some of the climate goals we put in place in Concord that are driving behavior. And it's not me. It's all collective. But very proud of that. And um, I think just persevering. It's not an easy. It's not been easy. I mean, nothing is. But... Um, that are still going. That's that's pretty interesting, and it's got a new flavor and new excitement. So I'm proud of that, and I've just found something that I love to do. People say, "Would well, you want to retire?" <laughs> like, well, I could, but why would I? I love what I do, and I have flexibility. And, and uh, right now, anyway, people wouldn't make any sense to retire. So I'm proud of that too. And um, just love the community we've built. Just the connections that have been made at a deep level. It's different, right, than getting people together and saying, let's just chat when you're really two days a quarter going deep into your challenges. You really get to know each other. We see how people operate, how they think. So um, having those outcomes of relationships I'm proud of that too, but that's, that's up to them, but they have, they've leveraged what we do and created some pretty amazing outcomes. So you heard, I didn't say anything about the, the, the liquidity, because to me, that's just a number. Um, I'm happy for them, but I'm most proud that they stuck with the journey and did the hard stuff. And what patterns have you seen among CEOs and startups? that have been most successful? Well, there are a couple of key things that just jump out. Like when you're a first-time CEO, um, there's some really hard things to do when you're forged in the the early stage startup, co-founder, early employees. You know, there's a, a passion, but there's a community that's built. And when the, when the team cannot 100% scale, and you have to let people go, or you have to change your roles, that's really hard. So I look at CEOs who learn that, first of all, it's the right thing to do, to do the right thing for the company, but to do it in a graceful, transparent, really honest way, and to set expectations early on. You know, don't give people VP titles or C-level titles when you're five of you, because you know that's most likely to change. Yeah. So make them heads up so that later they don't have to take a demotion and they may want to stay with the new person you bring in that can take the company to the next level. Um, so that's a whole theme about the team 
how to build the team, how to change the team, how to build the team culture, and make it the right team for the stage and size of the company. So that's one really important CEO learning skill set takes a lot because there's so much emotion tied up into it. And um, we always, uh, we have a saying in the forum, it used to be if there was a member challenge about should I or should I not let XYZ team member go, I would say, okay, we'll do that as a challenge. And then I learned to say, if you're even thinking that way, you know the answer. So don't waste your spot with that as a question. Let's talk more about the how. How do you do it gracefully? How do you do it well? Versus the should I. Um, managing a board of investors. Huge growth area over time for CEOs, and that never ends, really. Um, it's like, how much, how do you manage that board? How do you take in their ideas and advice and yet stay true to the course that you think is right for the company without getting them so angry they fire you? Um, and how to be transparent with the board and how to, rather than being sort of what I see a lot of early stage CEOs who feel like the board says, boo, they have to react. Uh, and, and so it's like, how do you build a system, systematic way of working with your board that, uh, that the board agrees to, you agree to, that really leverages the board? That's, and I'm talking mostly about investor boards. Um, fundraising. Managing that whole process, another big area of change transformation over time. Um, and I think the planning and strategy, getting building alignment across the company is one of the other key areas CEOs have to get super good at. And when you're early, it's pretty easy because there aren't that many people in the company, typically. As soon as you hit 40, 50 people, um, it gets much harder to communicate. Things start getting frayed. So you can't, you can't go back to what worked before, which is often the instinct. I mean, I can remember one planning session I was in at one of the companies I worked for. And the company had grown super fast. And CEO was worried about what to do because people were getting misaligned. It's like, well, early days was sort of, was sort of like, a coffee, you know, those old coffee makers, what are they, percolators? We percolated cool new ideas. So somehow we have to go back to being a percolator. There was this whole two-day session about how to be a percolator again. And <laughs> kind of like, but we're too fit to be a percolator now. <laughs> uh, but that's just an example of how hard it is when you've not done it before. Most people haven't. Um, what else? Think. Stories. I share one story about pushing back on the board. I was, I was giving a talk at Harvard's iLab a couple weeks ago, and um, I shared this one, which was, so there was a CEO who felt that the right thing to do was to take their company public and had an investor board, and the investor board had Two investors who were, um, had a different time horizon and a different output outcome that they were looking for. And so I posed a question to these early stage CEOs, said, what would you have done? Would you have listened to, the, listened to those investors and hired a banker and gone off and sold the company versus taking it public? And most of them said yes. So what really happened was that CEO went out and sold the idea to a different investor who bought out the other investors, and then the CEO took the company public. So it's just reframing these situations where it's always a balance of what the, what the investors are looking for, what the CEO believes the company's capable of, and how you align all that. Sometimes it's impossible, especially if companies are, cap tables are just too broken. Um, but there's, there's magic in being really good at really building something great and, and staying true to that. Does that help? Interesting. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I'm curious what you've noticed advising 
younger CEOs versus older and more experienced CEOs? I think younger CEOs are sometimes, well, there are all these things, right? Like you need to raise money. So you want to raise money and sometimes you really don't have an option. But there's a whole vetting process that should go on with who you're raising money from. What happens when their portfolio companies get into trouble? How do they treat the team? How transparent are they? Um, how do they work with their CEO? Do they just rip you out and then put somebody else in? Like, what's the culture of that firm? Where's the partner in their um, partnership? Are you dealing with it? Ryan? Is your new company? Or did you just get the first time board member who has to convince the whole partnership of why to keep funding your company? Or do you have a more seasoned board member who has weight? What happens on the board dynamics as you raise more funds and you bring in additional investors? Who's who in the pecking order? Do the early, do some firm kowtow to another firm because of the weight? of reputation, so much. Um, but many people don't think about that because why would they? I need the money. But long-term, these are the things that play out that can really be detrimental. Maybe it's five, 10 years from now. Um, the other I described to you already, another one, which is team. Titles are not free. Don't squander them. Don't do early stage big titles. It doesn't mean anything. And it can get you in a situation where you've got great people who leave because they're getting demoted, as I said earlier, or they just feel slighted as opposed to, hey, Ryan, you're great. Love what you're doing. We're on this growth journey. I sure hope at some point we'll probably hire someone over you because we've earned that right as a company because of our growth. And we need to bring in more experience or skills. But I will be sure it's someone, if you're doing a great job, who can mentor you, you can learn from. And maybe even be part of hiring, interviewing. Like, set that early. Otherwise, you're, you're agonizing. Like, you're a layer. Oh, my God. What do I do? Well, if you've already set the expectation, you say, you know what? This is great news. We're growing really fast. It's great for us all. Let's. Here's what I think we need to do organizationally. See the difference, though? Yes, definitely. Um, and just in terms of strategy, early stage, because you have a lot of money, it doesn't mean you spend it all. There's a lot of du jour of investor sentiment. And I think we saw it, well, we saw it big time with Silicon Valley Bank and how that went down. Um, but as a CEO, you have to keep steady on your force and do the right thing for the business and bring the board along with you. I mean, you've got to be responsible with their money. You want to give them a return. You have to be transparent, but you also have to stick to your principles and not be whiplashed by what happened at their partner meeting two days ago where they went through the Excel spreadsheet and picked these three people, these three companies have to get to cash flow break even in the next three months. Why? Not because of any fundamentals in the company, because they want to be able to tell that to their limiteds. So that kind of thing, you know, it's just reality of how, of how it um, can play out. So I think early stage CEOs just have, they don't have experience with that. And it's hard. And, and also, you wish that you had an all-seeing, all-powerful board that knew exactly what was right for you, but they hired you to be the CEO or they funded you because you're the CEO. You're the one who knows best. But you still need to take the advice and listen because a lot of advisors, board members, sure, have a huge amount of pattern recognition experience. Um, so it's the art of listening, being transparent, giving different scenarios, and then getting buy-in alignment and agreement as you go forward. That's a skill. It takes a lot to learn. And everyone's wired differently emotionally. They're paid. So if you're a pleaser person, it might be harder. If you're not a pleaser person, you might piss them off so much they fire you. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> so got to find a balance. They got to find a balance. Um, the other thing that's it's regarding and allocating company resources. And I think there's a tendency when you've raised a big chunk of money, sometimes there's the argument you raise too much. Maybe, maybe people do. And then you kind of, I recommend put it aside mentally. Like assume you're going to have to do a pivot or two. Don't go all out hiring sales and marketing until you really feel convincing. I mean, the term of the day is product market fit, but you know, is this really resonating with who you think your customer should be? And what are you learning? Be very measured about how you apply your resources. And don't let your team members outfight each other to get their resources and then screw it all up because you've got a loud mouth in some, some functions. And then I guess the last thing, this is a little harder, but you're building out your team and there's this great, experienced, amazing CEO who's now running a $200 million company um, sales org and says they want to come back and do a startup um, and that they don't mind rolling up their sleeves. And you kind of buy into it and you're also really impressed with what they've done or what's happened in the company. Just really be cautionary about that because... You don't know why the company was successful. I'm sure they had something to do with it, but it was probably a whole bunch of different things. Yeah, um, right. And don't think that um, because they were successful there, they will be equally successful in your company. And even though somebody says they know how to roll up their sleeves, they probably really don't. Because it's hard to go back to that when you've had a, big team and you get support and all those things. So I've seen a year go by when the CEO kind of knew it was a bad hire because that person wasn't delivering what they really needed for their stage. So you want to be really stage specific and you're thinking about how um, And you've got to investigate. You've got, <laughs> got to make sure the right stuff is happening. You can't take it for granted. Um, have a way of measuring success and getting under the covers. We have a saying of, in the forum, <laughs> you want to delegate, but you also need to yeah. inspect. Okay. How's that? That's fantastic. <laughs> Very fantastic. Uh, and that's perfect as we're getting, this is where we entered in, right? Yep. So that was the full loop? That was the full loop. <laughs>